Matthew chapter six. As we dig in to the Sermon on the Mount, um, which, as I've mentioned before, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, of course, is in Matthew chapters five, six, and seven, and um, it's it's very neatly structured. Um, three main parts, and then each of those parts have three parts, and so forth. Uh, part one we've already seen, and in part one, which is the first sixteen verses of chapter five, um, Jesus is telling us um, uh, who the citizens of this. He comes to announce the kingdom of God. Um, I mean, that's actually where it all begins back in chapter four. It says that Jesus went about proclaiming the kingdom of God is here. It's in your midst. It's right here. It's right now. It, of course, is also future, but it's right here right now because he's the king, he's the Messiah, and he's bringing the kingdom. And he's initiating his kingdom uh, with... Um, uh, a certain group of people. And, and who are those people? Well, you know, if, if you were a king or an emperor and you're, you're establishing your reign, um, <clears throat> from a worldly point of view, you'd surround yourself with uh, people who are, um, you know, rich and famous and influential and all that sort of thing. Um, Jesus instead uh, says this kingdom begins with the people that he describes in the Beatitudes, the people who are meek, the people who are mourning, the people who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, after longing for justice and so forth. Those are the people that are the salt, and those are the people that are the light of the world. And then uh, he moves into... Um, one second... a minute here, having a little bit of trouble. Um, then the main section, um, as I have also mentioned, falls into three parts. And part one, we've also seen, it's in verses 17 through 48 of chapter five, where Jesus is showing that um, it, he has not come to destroy the Torah. Instead, um, he's come to magnify the wisdom in the Torah and the prophets, what we call the Old Testament, um, and apply it in our lives today. Um, and that wisdom teaches us how to live a righteous life. Remember, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, then you're not going to be a part of this kingdom. Um, so he's showing us the wisdom that's under those laws. Uh, now we move in, as we get into chapter 6, into <clears throat> the second part of the main section, which has to do with religious practices, uh, which are designed uh, to align our hearts with God's, uh, to align our hearts with God's heart, um, to make us, uh, to mold us, to shape us, to make us more like Jesus. So, in other words, he's going to teach us in chapter 6, how to practice righteousness. The Greek word, as you know, we've mentioned it several times, is dikaiosenu, uh, which means doing right. Uh, doing right by God, um, that's righteousness. Doing right by ourselves, that's righteousness. Doing right by others, doing right by creation. How do we practice this? How does this become uh, uh, how do we flesh this out? How does it become real in our daily lives? And as we begin in chapter 6, I think there's two things that we really need to keep in mind, which are fundamental to understanding not just this chapter, but the whole Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the first thing is that we are blessed, and this is really what the Beatitudes are about, we are blessed if we join God in making all things new. And how do we join God in making all things new? By promoting the well-being of God, of others, of ourselves, and of creation. How do you promote the well-being of God? You promote the well-being of God by promoting the well-being of the least of God's sisters and brothers. So we'll see that. We'll come back to that in just a moment. 
um, we promote our own well-being, not in a selfish sense, not promoting our own well-being in the sense of making ourselves rich and famous or any of that, but uh, what's spiritually best for us. Um, we promote the well-being of others. We promote the well-being of creation. The second thing that we need to keep in mind, and this is the heart of the matter as we get into chapter uh, 6 and, and spilling over into chapter 7, uh, there are two desires which are pull us out of the flow of God's kingdom. We talk about walking in the Spirit or living in the Spirit. We talk about joining God as God makes all things new. We talk about um, being his, his ambassadors on earth. Um, in order to do that, we have to be in the, in the central current of what God is doing. Um, we have to join God in making all things new. God's already making all things new. We have to discern where and how God's making all things new, and then we need to join God. But there are two things that will keep us from doing that. The first one is the desire to have the approval of other people. And the second one is the desire to secure ourselves with material wealth. We won't get to the second one today, but we will look at the first one, the desire to have the approval of other people. That's something to guard against because it will pull us out of the flow of God's Spirit. I'm not suggesting that it puts you um, you know, in a place where you've, you've sinned away God's grace or any of that sort of thing. I'm just saying that we're not in the flow of the Spirit. Um, rather than uh, gently drifting down the river, with the current. Instead, we're, you know, high and dry on the bank. So, uh, Jesus gives us a, a, a principle, followed by three examples of that principle. The three examples are alms, prayer, and fasting. Uh, Jesus was Jewish. Everybody that he's speaking to in the context of the Sermon on the Mount is Jewish. And to be a Jew in the first century meant that you practiced these three things, and this was baked into their culture. Every Jew gave alms to the poor. Every Jew uh, participated in prayer, and every Jew fasted on a regular basis. It was it was just part. Uh, it, it was like eating three meals a day. You know, well, fasting isn't. You know, <laughs> it's a regular habit, is what I'm trying to say. Now, if Jesus were to uh, give his principle and then call for some examples in our lives, um, he might use those same three things, or uh, speaking to a typical group of American Protestants, he, he might emphasize prayer, reading your Bible, and going to church. Those are things that most Protestants are told they have to do. If he was here today and speaking to a group of our Orthodox or Catholic friends, uh, he, he would probably put the emphasis on uh, the sacraments, at least uh, there are seven sacraments in Catholicism. Uh, five of them apply to everybody. They are Eucharist, reconciliation, baptism, confirmation, and anointing of the sick. Uh, the other two are marriage and holy orders, um, which apply to some people, but not everybody. So Jesus might, you know, pick some of those as examples. So First of all, the principle. The principle is don't do your righteousness in order to be seen. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Beware of practicing your dikaisenu, your doing right, the good deeds that you're doing. Beware of practicing it before others in order to be seen of them, for then you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is saying, don't do good for the purpose of being seen. Um, God knows our hearts. God knows our motives. Um, I'm, I don't know if you follow social media or not. Um, you're probably better off if you don't. But anyway, um, there's been a rash of people and uh, that come up on my feed, and there there are these people that um, surprise other people with very very generous monetary gifts, 
but of course they're filming it all and they're putting it out on social media for millions and millions of people to see. Jesus said, don't do good for the purpose of being seen. Uh, watch your motives. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Os Guinness who coined the phrase that we are, as Christians, playing to an audience of one. So righteousness, dukaiosenu, is doing right by God. It's doing right by others. It's doing right by ourselves. It's doing right by creation. And creation care is very much a part of the essential gospel. And first, in fact, it's the very first thing that God commands humans to do back in the book of Genesis. So it's all important. Um, doing right by God, others, ourselves, and nature. Uh, and and when we do that, it it blesses everybody and everything around us. And the point that Jesus is making is that there's only one person's approval that we need to care about. There's only one person that we want to have applaud, and that's God. It doesn't make any difference whether other people see it or acknowledge it or like it. Um, that's not the point. And you will notice that um, Jesus says, uh, if you do it to be seen, he's talking in this context, uh, you know, as a general principle, if you're doing it to be seen, these righteous deeds, um, then uh, you're not going to have God's reward. And uh, that that uh, pulls some people kind of up short. Um, um, I, I've, I, and I, I've been in that category myself at times. I've thought, well, you know, if we're humble, why should we be seeking any kind of a reward? I mean, shouldn't that just not even be on our minds? Um, but uh, it, it's okay to seek the approval of God, which is what we're talking about. Um, you know, in, in his last letter, the Apostle Paul, just before he was executed, he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but all who have longed for his appearing. So, you know, Paul did not think it was immodest to uh, seek the uh, uh, approval, the blessing, uh, what he calls the crown, um, from God. Now, that's the principle. Then Jesus gives us three examples. The first one is alms, which means giving to the poor. And he says in chapter 6, verse 2, Whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you give your alms, generosity to the poor uh, is, a, is a positive religious practice. Every follower of God should be generous to the poor. That's part of following, that, that's part of the very nature of God. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, it was absolutely baked in to Jewish culture. Um, st still is, as a matter of fact. Um, th th that's why um, you know Jewish charities have have uh, had such a profound effect. Um, the the importance of taking care of those who are unable to take care of themselves. But what Jesus is saying, he's certainly not saying stop giving to the poor, not by any means. He's just saying, be careful that your religious devotion doesn't become a way to elevate yourself. Um, he says, don't be like the hypocrites who go around blowing a trumpet. Um, now, I, I've, uh, <laughs> I, I've heard numerous sermons, and I've read in umpteen different uh, commentaries, and I know I've repeated it myself, that um, that it, uh, it was common in Jesus' day for um, the Pharisees, you know, to to blow the shofar, and then all the poor people would gather around them. And they made a big show. Um, as I dug into that a little bit more, uh, I don't think there's any evidence of that at all. I think that 
what Jesus is saying here, uh, I think he's using the trumpeting as a figure of speech. He's using it as uh, a, a touch of sarcasm, calling attention to yourself in any way. And he says that's what the hypocrites do. Now, it's important to understand how Jesus is using the word that's that's the word hypocrite. That is a Greek word. It's just transliterated over into English. In classical Greek, as you probably know, the word hypocrite meant an actor, uh, someone who puts on a false face. Um, because in Greek, um, ancient Greek uh, tragedies and comedies, um, plays, uh, they, they didn't generally wear costumes like would be common today. Instead, they would have those famous kinds of masks that represent um, tragedy and comedy uh, on, on sticks, and they would hold them before their faces. And there were lots of others besides the one that was sad and the one that's happy. Um, there were all sorts of other expressions, too. And, and so the word literally, in classical Greek, before the time of Christ, uh, meant to hide behind a mask. Um, we today use the word hypocrisy generally to mean, uh, to refer to saying one thing and doing the other. Um, and in that sense, you know, you, we think of politicians especially promising all this stuff and then having no intention to do it just uh, and we would say that's hypocritical to do that jesus does not use the word in either of those senses um, his usage is similar but it's different um, and as a matter of fact this word hypocrite is only used by jesus in the new testament and it occurs I'm told, I didn't count it myself, uh, 17 times in the New Testament. Um, Jesus uses the word to mean doing the right thing for wrong reasons. So it's not just saying one thing and doing the other. It's doing something which is good and right, but doing it for the wrong reasons. And, of course, we need to really be cautious because you can do right things for wrong reasons and not even be aware of it. That's why we need to be in touch with the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to uh, be continually in prayer. Um, not that it should paralyze us, but we need to be in prayer. Lord, you know, search my heart and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and guide me and, and make my... Um, you know, if my motive is off, if I'm doing this thing, which is a good thing to do, but if I'm doing it for the wrong reasons, if I'm doing it to draw attention to myself or to promote myself or uh, e even, you know, unconsciously, please show me that and uh, change me so that I will be doing right things for the right reasons. Um, when Jesus says, when you give to the poor, um, he he's pulling on a thread which goes all the way back to the beginning of Judaism. Um, in Proverbs 14, the scripture says, those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but those who are kind to the needy honor their maker. And in Proverbs 19, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will be repaid in full. It's a powerful statement. It's saying that if you give money to the poor, you're actually giving money to God. You're lending money to God. And God will see to it that you're repaid. It might not be in cash. It might be in some other way. But God will not remain in your debt. Um, God will see to it that you are recompensed. The point here, both in Proverbs and actually throughout the, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and here in the Sermon on the Mount, the point is that the way we relate to the poor is the way we relate to God. Because God identifies with the poor. Remember Matthew 25? You know, in that you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. Well, Lord, Lord, when did we see you sick or and visit you? When did we go see you in prison? You know, when when were you naked and we clothed you? When were you hungry and we fed you? In that you've done it to the least of these, my 
brothers and sisters. You've done it to me. And the opposite is also true. In so far as we neglect the poor, we're neglecting to care for God. We, God identifies with the poor. Giving to the poor is lending to Yahweh. So we are called um, as followers of Jesus to radical generosity. And the top of the list are those uh, for recipients of that generosity are those who are poor. Scripture says Jesus went about doing good, and that's what we're called to do. We're supposed to go about doing good. And historically, Christians have done a lot of good, and I, I, I think this often gets lost. Um, you know, people, uh, they take sort of a cursory look at uh, Christian history, and they say, well, you know, these, these Christians, they were responsible for the Crusades and the Inquisition and the Holocaust and so forth. Um, well, people calling themselves Christians were responsible for those things. There's no denying that. But true followers of Jesus historically invented hospitals. There, there weren't any before the Christians came along. Christians invented orphanages to care for um, you know, people who had children who had lost their parents. They invented in more modern times hospice uh, programs in, in homes and centers. Um, Christians invented the idea of food banks and respite care, and, and the list goes on. Christians have done a lot of good in the world, um, which is great. We need to keep doing that. But we need to be careful that we do it for the right reason, because in our modern culture, uh, there's a game that that is often played within charity, and that is, yes, you know, I, I'll give to your charity as, as long as I'm recognized. I get my name on a plaque, or if I have a lot of money, you know, I get my name on the side of the building or something. Um, uh, or it might not be a plaque. It might be knowing that if I give to this cause, I'm going to be invited to the gala. And and there are important people at the gala, and that's going to enhance, you know, my my business connections within the community. And I, it it all gets very entangled. Um, and so we need to do good, but not do it for the plaque or for the connections, uh, not for the purpose of gaining any advantage to ourselves or any praise to ourselves. Um, the second example that Jesus gives is prayer, um, and that uh, begins in chapter 6, verse 5, <clears throat> which, and prayer, of course, is simply connection to God. It's heart-to-heart -heart communication with God. There's all different sorts of forms of prayer. Some are very formal. Some are very informal. Some are... Um, premeditated, some are spontaneous. That's None of that is really essential. I mean, none of that's the, the essential issue. The, the point of prayer, however it's offered, is that it needs to be our hearts connecting with the hearts of God. And I think it's really important to emphasize that a big portion of prayer that we often forget about, or at least I do, is learning to be quiet, learning to be still, learning to just sit still, do nothing, focus on that inner voice of love, that gentle, sweet whisper of love. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, to take the time for uh, Lecto Divina, which means divine reading in, in Latin, where we take a passage of Scripture and we just meditate on it, we, we a, a very short passage of Scripture, and, and we read it over and over and over again, and we just let each word sink into our hearts, and we we just stop and, and allow God to bring forth deeper, fuller meaning. That's all part of prayer, too. It's not just talking to God. It's listening to God. So Jesus continues uh, chapter 6, verse 5, whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. 
Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. See, what they really want is to be seen by others. And they are seen by others. So they got their reward. Um, and, and that's all that's going to come of it. There's not going to be any further reward from God. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the nations do. Some translations say the Gentiles, which means the Gentile nations. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So, uh, sometime after the Babylonian captivity, there developed in Judaism a tradition of uh, fixed prayer hours. And uh, um, uh, some forms of Judaism still hold to those fixed prayer hours. Um, there are um, um, brands of Christianity that do the same thing. Um, if, if you go, for example, to the uh, Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky, where... Um, Thomas Merton spent much of his life. Um, there you'll find this group of mostly very elderly monks who uh, who all work. They they all produce stuff, and, and they're famous for their uh, 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 fruit cake of all things. <laughs> but uh, but then seven times a day. Uh, the bell rings, and they stop what they're doing, and they gather in the chapel, and they have their hours of prayer. Um, Muslims do the same thing in in uh, uh, in some forms of of Islam. Um, so they developed this tradition of fixed prayer hours. So if you're a Jew in Jesus' day, um, and it, it's time for prayer, you just stop wherever you are and you pray. The temptation was to kind of manipulate, plan your day so that you just happen to be in public. Maybe you just happen to be on the street corner of the market where there's lots of people around to see you. Or maybe you just happen to be uh, right out in front of the synagogue so that, you know, the rabbi's going to see you there. And he's going to know that, that you're a really spiritual person and, you know, he's, maybe he'll put you in some position of uh, leadership or something. Um, that, that was the Jewish tradition at that time. Um, the problem was not praying in public. Jesus is not opposed to praying in public. The problem was praying in order to be seen. So to flip that, what Jesus says is go to the opposite of the public place. In other words, if you're going to manipulate your day to be in a certain place when it's prayer time, uh, manipulate your day so that you're in a place where nobody can see you, you know, in your house, in the closet kind of thing. Um, of, of course, you could do that in such a way as to draw attention to yourself if you're not careful. Um, Jesus is simply saying that um, uh, w we need to have honest hearts before God and to to keep these times of these set times of prayer and you know your tradition my tradition may not have fixed prayer hours but the principle still applies um and again jesus is not opposed to public prayer um and he, he's not giving a law don't ever pray in public you know the only time you can pray is if you're in your closet um not that not at all uh the point is don't do it in order to be seen uh, be oblivious to whether you're being seen or not. It 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 doesn't make any difference. Um, I saw one uh, televangelist one time um, uh, who was dressed um, in in a rather expensive, outrageous way, and um, he was strutting back and forth and doing his thing. Um, and then he kept saying, "Don't look at me! Don't look at me!" and yeah, you know, my my thought was I I can't see anything but you. You know, you're your center stage. You're calling attention to yourself by everything that you do. Jesus also says, don't follow that uh, Gentile tradition, that 
pagan tradition of meaningless repetition. That was the practice in, in a lot of uh, Greek and Roman religion. Um, and, you know, again, people have, have, I think, taken this out of context. And they said, well, you know, uh, all prayer should be spontaneous. Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, other people have said um, that, that God is opposed to set rituals. No, he's not. Thoughtful ritual can be very, very powerful. And written prayers, like in the Anglican uh, Book of Prayer, for example, those are powerful, powerful prayers that have stood the test of time. Um, I, I use some of them on a, on a regular basis because they express so much better than I can um, what I'm feeling and, and what the heart of God is. So Jesus isn't saying um, never repeat the same prayers. He's not saying... Um, uh, you know, stay away from ritual or anything like that, because you know you, you you can do spontaneous prayers in a way to be draw attention to yourself and be seen. Um, these these are not laws; these are principles. His point is uh, to make sure your heart and mind are focused on Him, uh, whether it's that ritual or whether it's a written prayer or whether it's a spontaneous prayer, um, all of those things can be done for the right reason. They can also be done for the wrong reason. Um, don't do your righteousness. Don't practice your right doing in such a way as to draw attention to yourself. Jesus says they already have their reward um, if you know, if you're doing it to be seen and others see you, well, congratulations, you got your reward. Um, as I said, we need to be indifferent to whether or not others hear us. Um, and, you know, when he says, go into the your closet, go into the secret place, wh where's that? Um, it's not so much that Jesus is literally saying to climb in your closet, Although, you know, I've met people that do that and it works for them. That's all right. Um, as long as they're not, you know, calling attention to the fact, hey, everybody, I'm in my prayer closet. Um, the secret place is where God is. Um, he, he, he who dwells in the secret place dwells in the heart of God. Um, abides under the shadow of the Almighty, Psalm 91 says. Um, the prayer is so important because it reveals to us who God is and what kind of God God is. So some takeaway points. Um, doing right by the poor is doing right by God. Every time you do something to help the poor, you are doing it to God. <laughs> uh, Every time we allow pridefulness to swell within us, our souls are going to shrivel. So do right, do good. Uh, and Jesus gives us some examples here, giving of alms, praying. The other example he's going to give us, which we'll get to later, is fasting. Um, do these good things, these right things. And, you know, we could add other things to it. We We, we could add the 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 sacraments if we come from that tradition or we could add um uh having devotions every morning if we come from that sort of tradition um do right but do it for the right reason do it not to be seen but in order to um connect yourself with the heart of god um god so desires for us to be in fellowship with himself and to bring us into his heart of love where we can uh, rest in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And all of these things, the, the taking of communion is, is one way to, it, it's a little ritual by which we're reminded of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's a little ritual by which we uh, have a little appetizer looking forward to the coming kingdom of God, the marriage feast of the Lamb. 
it's a little ritual which reminds us <laughs> pardon me that we are connected with god in communion with god and in communion with each other when we give to the poor we're giving to god when we pray we are communing with god when we take communion we're communing with god all of these things are beautiful things and all of them can be done and sadly sometimes are done in such a way as to draw attention to ourselves and if that's our motive then we've already gotten our reward people noticed people said oh well well he's a really look at that holy fellow over there but if we want god's smile god's pleasure god's applause we ask god to make our hearts humble before him so that we will continue to do these good righteous things on a regular basis we'll do them for the right reasons we'll do them to form our own characters to become more and more like jesus to be a blessing to others to ourselves to the creation that god's given us to be a blessing as it were to god and if we're walking in the spirit we'll we'll be pretty much oblivious to whether or not other people are noticing or not so as we come to the lord's table i invite you to take the bread which jesus said was his body broken for us and remember that at the passover feast jesus broke the bread and then he distributed it to his disciples and he said eat this all of you for this is my body broken for you the body of christ amen secondly i invite you to take the cup in remembrance of the time when jesus lifted up the passover cup blessed it and then passed it around to his disciples and said drink from this cup each of you for this cup is the new covenant in my blood as so often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes the blood of christ amen gracious god i thank you for giving us various means of grace ways in which we can participate in the kingdom of god ways like prayer ways like caring for the poor ways like participating in the various aspects of the good works that you're doing throughout the world I thank you that we can be a part of the flow of your Holy Spirit. So help us, Lord, to enthusiastically continue to participate in all of those activities which further your kingdom, advance your cause, bring glory to your name, and guard our hearts, O Lord, so that we will always do those good things for right reasons, never for the purpose of drawing attention to ourselves or promoting ourselves or receiving honor from other people or anything like that, but instead that our motives might always and only be to honor you, to serve you, to glorify you, to demonstrate our love for you and father i ask all these things in the precious holy name of jesus amen <laughs>